Okay, so it's after break. Are there any pediatricians in the audience? <coughs> oh, thank goodness, because some of the clinical stuff I'm gonna talk about is probably a rough approximation. So um, in industry, it was the home of three-letter acronyms. In the medical world, it's four, five, and six-letter acronyms. So NICU is the Neonative Intensive Care Unit. There's four levels, and at Rady Children's in San Diego, we have a level three, level four, which are the absolute sickest babies in the system. And PICU is for a pediatric intensive care unit. There's also something called the CVICU, which is cardiovascular intensive care unit. So if there's any other acronyms I haven't caught in here, please let me know. If you don't know anything about Rady, we're the sixth largest children's hospital in the United States and we are the largest children's hospital in the state of California. And there's something, there's a lot of things that are unique about Rady Children's. One thing that's unique is um, our population is incredibly diverse. I've got a slide on that coming up. But we also have really large market share. So we basically compete with Kaiser and with the Naval Hospital. There's a, San Diego's a big military town. So we have about 92% market share. This gives us the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of other hospitals. So if you're in the script system in San Diego, then Ravy Neonatologists will be seeing you. Same thing at Sharp, same thing at Palomar, um, Palomar and some of the other areas. So we have an average daily census in the NICU of about 80 babies. Um, and we have 28 in the um, CVICU. We have seven NICU locations, so right now we're doing our rapid whole genome sequencing primarily at the main hospital um, at Rady Children's. So one thing I did not put in here is actually a slide to tell you a little about, about the institute. So Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine is about two years old. Um, in San Diego, there's a lot of life science companies. Illumina is there, Thermo Fisher is there, Etico Genomes there. So we have a board of like 35 industry people and they talk about ways to differentiate the hospital, and the board was like, you should do something in genomics. So they go to Mr. Rady, who's our favorite philanthropist, with a $10 million business plan to dabble in pediatric genomics. Mr. Rady's a pretty smart guy. He's like, hey, you're not thinking big enough. Um, I want to give you $120 million to start an institute. So he did that in 2014. It took a year to find a CEO. They brought in Stephen Keensmore, who's from Children's Mercy, but he's also been in industry. He's been around for a really long time. He was a key opinion leader for many of us. So the Institute's just about two years old. Stephen came September of 2015. And I joined September of last year, and we're growing about as fast as DNA Nexus is growing. So I was employee number 19, and I think now we're up to like 60-some people at the Institute. Okay, so little genetics, little bit different perspective. So on an average day in the U.S., there's about 11,000 babies born. So four million babies in the U.S. per year. 437 of those babies will have at least one genetic disorder. And 64 babies in the U.S. die before their first birthday. So here's an example, just to make it really practical, of how rare, rare disease is. So we have a colleague here from Sutter Health in the Sacramento Hospital area. They have five hospitals. They do 12,000 annual births. That's a pretty healthy size system. I can't remember, Greg, you told me how many total hospitals you have. Three and a half million patients. So it's a pretty healthy size population. So Down syndrome, one in 700. So they'll see 17 babies annually there. Cornelia Delane, if I'm saying that correctly, is one in 10,000. We've seen two of those incidences since we started doing our sequencing in San Diego, but usually in a system the size of the Sacramento region, you'd only see one of those a year. Prater Willie, one in every 2.5 years, and McCarty, McCardle syndrome is even more rare. So it makes it very difficult if you're a clinician to know what to look for. So chances are you probably haven't seen a child like this before. So I talked a little bit about the diversity in San Diego. If you do the math, be, depending on what site you're at, at the main RCHSD is Rady Children's Hospital, San Diego, the main NICU. So we actually have 80% of our population is non-Caucasian or non-Northern European descent. So it's pretty diverse. Um, in other parts, the lowest it gets in the San Diego County area that we see is 60% of our population is non-white. 
So the other thing that's really interesting, and one of the reasons why Stephen is so focused on critically ill kids, is 10% of the kids that are the sickest consume 70% of the resources on healthcare cost. Not only that, they're the youngest, so if you can do something to help these kids have a more normal life, then they might grow old enough to have the chronic disease <laughs> that we heard about earlier this morning, which is really depressing. So, um, so you actually have the highest quality adjusted life year span. So I'm gonna show some health economic data on this, but for the state of California, if we can get these babies out of the NICU and actually onto a treatment regimen that changes their prognosis, we can save the state of California by doing rapid whole genome sequencing $81 million. So it's a, it's a pretty compelling opportunity from an outcome perspective and also from a cost effectiveness perspective. Okay, so this is, we're actually thinking this is the first thing that we're doing is rapid precision medicine in the NICU. It, as I said, it affects 3% of the kids in the US. It's the leading, genetic disease is the leading cause of infant death. And it's also the leading cause of death in the NICU and the PICU. So what's different about these babies, maybe three or four days old, so they don't have a lot of the classic genetic dysmorphology that you would expect in an adult or even somebody that was like a year old. So we saw, we saw a charge baby, and I think they're supposed to have like connected eyebrows, but the eyebrows haven't come in yet, so it's impossible to tell that. And you also, as we talked about, have the biggest time span for benefit. Okay, so here's our hypothesis. If you do comprehensive genetic testing, and you do timely, specific care, you have better patient outcomes. So we started doing sequencing. We started sending it out in July of 2016. Um, we were doing roughly one baby a week. And we were struggling with the turnaround time because we had to send the sample out and wait until they batched on an X5 or an X10. I think they needed eight to 10 samples. So sometimes we wouldn't get the file uploaded in DNA Nexus for like four to five days. And it takes us a day or so to do the interpretation. So we started doing our own testing in-house. We never had this dream of being a big sequencing shop, but the turnaround time was really critical. So we bought two um, HiSeq 2500s, one HiSeq 4000. The 2500s, we can run those in 26 hours at 45X coverage, basically one genome per flow cell. And the 4000, we can do a trio. We run that in the 60 hour mode um, if it's not an acutely, as acutely ill kid. So, um, so far, as of the last month, we had 157 families enrolled, multiple protocols. I'll talk about those in a little bit. We have about a 34% diagnostic yield, which is pretty good. It started out a lot higher, 40 to 50%, but we are cherry picking the cases. Now we're not cherry picking the cases. So if you don't have isolated sepsis, if you don't have isolated prematurity, HIE with a precipitating event and some other very clear clinical criteria, and you're in the NICU, our goal is to get you enrolled in the protocol within four days of admission. So the really compelling number, and the number that we're focused on the most, is 81% of the time we change care. So that doesn't mean that we call the genetic counselor, nothing wrong with genetic counseling, but it's not like they had a genetic counseling consultation visit. They either avoided a procedure, or got the transplant, or got a therapy change, or something significant changed 80% of the time. So, and right now we're doing a lot of trios. We started a randomized clinical trial June, July-ish, where we're randomizing to rapid whole exome, rapid whole genome, and comparing those. Uh, if the baby's acutely ill, because our whole exome turnaround time's not as quick as our, we sent those out, then we won't enroll them in that trial. That's kind of where the multiple protocols come in. But we're doing a lot of trios, and we're finding it increases our ability to make a diagnosis about 10% of the time. So we're trying to figure out it's a big difference in cost if you're doing singletons versus trios. About 50% of the patients are a de novo mutation. 50% are inherited. Our average turnaround time, this includes all samples done to date, is six days it's from consent to diagnosis. And we have this provision with the FDA because we're doing everything under a research IRB. It's, we call it break the glass. So if we find something and there's an immediate life-changing opportunity to do something, we don't have to wait for Sanger confirmation. We can do a verbal provisional report to the clinician 
and we've done that. Of the 52 diagnoses, probably half of the time we have broken the glass and done the verbal confirmation. And our fastest enrollment to date is 37 hours. So our goal is pretty routinely to do it less than 40. Our first NovaSeq will go into production mode next week or the week after. And um, we'll be running the S2 flow cell when 29 hours of uh, sequencing time. I think, I think you guys are doing the 60 hour turnaround time. We are optimized for speed, not for cost. Thank you, Mr. Rady. <laughs> so, and he's not really even, he's like barely a billionaire. He's not like really that wealthy, so we need to find <laughs> some more. We really, <laughs> don't tell him I said that, but. Um, <laughs> Okay, so kind of how this works today, the current standard of care is about 60 days. So sometimes it's an iterative process, even if it's a panel, a panel might come back negative, you might get the panel back quicker, send out microarray, but you can kind of see that it's an iterative process. With some of the collaborators in this room, including our friends at Etico Genome, we do hold the world record for two days. And what we've seen so far with actually the data that we're generating in San Diego, is 24% improved outcomes, 75% shorter hospital stays, and 85% decrease in cost of treating that patient. That's really important for the pediatric population because about half those babies are gonna be covered by Medi-Cal, Medicare, some, some public paying um, events. So we're definitely working very much with the payers to convince them this is the right thing to do. Okay, so let me walk you through an actual case and just for the record, these slides were submitted to DNA Nexus before the Time Magazine article came out, but this just happens to be the baby that's also featured in that article if you haven't seen it. So um, her name is Sebastiani. So her mother um, delivered the baby, had a relatively uncomplicated um, pregnancy, um, but when the baby was born, not too long after that, the baby, they started to notice the baby was kind of jittery. And within 16 hours, the baby was seizing. And if you have a seizing baby, sometimes they're doing 60 seizures a day. It's not just like they seize like once in a while. So this is a pretty significant event. And she was transferred to Radies as a three-day-old. I have no idea what this is, but, I, well, it's an EEG that shows birth suppressions. I have no idea what that means. But the clinical team was suspecting a couple different things. What's important is when they were suspecting Odahara syndrome, which it turned out to be Odahara syndrome, but there's like eight different drugs and you have to kind of go in order as a standard of care is when you prescribe these drugs. So they started her on phenobarbital and some of the other usual suspects and she wasn't responding at all to the medication. And if you read the article, at this point, the mother's been told that the baby's probably not gonna live. So they rush everybody together to do the baptism in the hospital room. We're using, um, we do 45X coverage, and because we have a diverse population, we have a lot of variants from the normal reference genome. So we have about four million to go through. So we're incredibly um, aligned with phenotypic information. Right now we have fellows that sit and manually scrub the, the medical record to pull out the HPO terms, and we're trying to use some structured data sets to do that. I'll talk a little bit more about how we're trying to automate that in a little bit. So basically, day one of admission into our hospital, we got her consented, we did a trio, so we got, had both parents. We prep the sample, we do the sequencing, and then the team gets together for analysis interpretation. So this is not a team that just shows up eight to five. So I think this particular case was over the weekend. We have a baby that was like midnight on New Year's Eve, so whenever the team gets a notification that the file's been uploaded, we have some crazy guys that wake up at one and two o'clock in the morning and start looking at genomes. So we did find a KCMQ2 mutation. Um, by the way, we only report pathogenic and likely pathogenic results. So only something that explains the, the symptoms that the baby's experiencing. We don't look for anything else. We don't look for a BRCA1 gene unless it might be implicated in, in what the baby's exhibiting. So we found that um, a likely pathogenic variant we had a mutation hotspot in the gene, and we broke the glass. So breaking, breaking the glass had pretty significant impact. Because we knew the mutation spot, the literature that we found said that the seventh line treatment 
in combination with another drug was the right thing to do to help this baby stop seizing. They gave her the drug. Within 16 hours, she completely stopped seizing. She went home 12 days later, which is 18 days after she was admitted in time to be home with the family for Christmas. So from the files of, you can't make this stuff up, a year before that, we had the same neurologist, the same neonatologist, and a baby presented with basically about the same symptoms. But the institute wasn't up and running. So this baby was admitted, they had the birth suppressions, they did the standard testing, they got the microarray result back, I think it was microarray, KCNQ2, it took six weeks. That baby is neurologically devastated. So doesn't have any chance of having a normal life, expensive baby, um, and sad for the family. The baby that you saw in the Time article has had one additional seizure since she went home, but they think it was tied to a respiratory infection. You can see her picture in the article. She looks pretty happy, the parents certainly are, and they think she's a little bit delayed on walking and some of the other things, but they think that she's probably gonna catch up. So this has a really big change on outcomes. But as a business person, it also has changes on the math, and we're trying to get, we have a lot of people um, at different hospitals that want us to start helping them do this, but not everybody has a Mr. Rady in their backyards. We have to try to figure out a way in the absence of reimbursement that hospitals can afford to do this and understand what the implications are for their institute. So we, we did a hard stop of the first 42 cases in order to submit an abstract for ACMG. So we had done 42 cases from June until February. I think abstracts were due February or March for ACMG last year. And now you can tell since February to September, we've done another 120 cases. So we're, our volume is ramping up big time. You can see we had a Neiman Pitt case, we had an Aird 1B case, we had a really spectacular JAG-1 case. This baby was going in for a high morbidity procedure for biliary atresia. Um, the anesthesiologist apparently has a prostate issue. It's probably too much information. Um, but he stepped, the baby was on the operating room table. He had to step out to use the restroom. We broke the class, called the operating room, and the baby didn't get the procedure. And absolutely would have needed a liver transplant, I think, in these cases, if I remember correctly, within two to three years. Very, very risky, sad case, and now they, um, they're in pretty good shape. The KCNQ2 case, if you look at how we modeled this, we tried to find a control case and we try, and we actually, of this 42 data set, how, I'm hurting on time. On this 42 data set, we actually could have modeled 18 of the patients, but we couldn't make completely unarguable, um, how do you say, discussions with payers. There would have been maybe some room where we might have disagreed, but these six cases were hard in facts and very, very easy to say we are very conservative how we modeled this. And so we saved a lot of money. One of them we saved a lot of money was a palliative care case, unfortunately. But even if you take that case out, it more than covers our costs for doing the rapid whole genome. And we're getting ready to publish this data. We're just waiting for IRB approval. So hopefully we'll have this published before the end of the year. So how many kids in the US would benefit? So it's all about assumptions, but if you do the math, it's somewhere between 20 to 40,000 babies born every year would benefit from a rapid genome. So we're not talking about a boatload of babies, um, although we are talking about the opportunity to impact a lot of babies. So right now, our capacity with bringing, we're gonna get three NovaSeqs. Right now, we can do about 1,000 genomes a year. By the end of 2017, we'll be closer to 2,000, because we'll have our new NovaSeq online. By the end of 2018, our plans to be able to do 5,000 rapid genomes a year. So we're really ramping up because part of the Mr. Rady's mandate was it wasn't just for San Diego County. So what does ramping up look like? So Denny Sanford is a guy that splits his time between Sioux Falls, it's either, what's one of the Dakotas, south or north, I don't know. Um, but between Sioux Falls, <laughs> I know, I'm your typical American, I don't know geography. Um, I'm from the West Coast, <laughs> so, um, and he's, yeah, somewhere up there. Is there, any, hopefully nobody here is from Sioux Falls. I'm going there in a couple weeks. And then he splits his time in San Diego. So this guy helped figure out the algorithm for Visa, for doing everything electronically, so every time somebody uses their Visa card, he's printing money. 
So this guy is a really wealthy billionaire. So he formed a pediatric genomic consortium of his seven favorite places to play golf. So it's Miami Children's, San Diego, Sioux Falls, Minneapolis, I have questions, um, Denver Children's, Tucson, I'm missing one, THLA, Los Angeles. So that pediatric genomic consortium are the first seven hospitals that we're bringing up, but that wasn't quite ambitious enough, so we're actually talking to additional hospitals outside there. So we started, we did our first external sample from Children's Hospital of Orange County at the end of July. Um, and now Minnesota is online and they're sending us roughly one to two babies a week. Minnesota has a NICU in Minneapolis and in St. Paul, the two largest NICUs in the United States. So we're looking for them to continue to send us tons of samples. Um, and the other thing that we learned from the insurance companies is, hey, there's, a, you know, there's not a lot of medical geneticists out there. This is a really rare skill set. So you cannot just go to hospitals where they have really large academic centers. If we're gonna implement this nationwide, it has to be something that can be done in a rural setting. So we're actually partnering with other hospitals that don't have medical genetics to say that, hey, so how are we setting that whole thing up? And finally, this is where DNA Nexus comes into play. So we're setting up a collaboration portal built on DNA Nexus. The partner hospitals don't have to have any high performance compute. We'd really like them to have genetic counselors so there's somebody that can help the clinical team figure out how to return results. But we built a portal. I don't think we knew that, Ray maybe didn't know that you guys could have built the portal, but Ray built a portal. They go in there, they order a test. They get a requisition labels to put on. While the sample is in transit to, thank you, um, San Diego, we get on the phone with the clinical team. If they give us access to their EMR, then we'll go in and manually scrub and get the phenotype. Otherwise, we have a teleconference to get it. And same thing when we return results. So I won't go through all the elements of that, but just a couple quick things on how we're doing this. Right now, as I said, it's manual and we have a whole bunch of fellows who put the HPO terms together, but we are working to um, automate that with a company out of the UK that uses natural language processing. Um, Clint, I think, they've been doing it for 15 years and um, a collaboration that we have with Alexion kind of led us to Clint, I think. We're an epic shop, 50% of the children's hospitals are Cerner, it doesn't matter, we can go into both EMRs, um, obviously, we work really closely with Illumina and Etico and Fabric and DNA Nexus, our, our primary partners. So these hospitals get a, we all open a project for them in DNA Nexus. We upload reference genomes for them to start playing around with before we return results. They can store the data up there. They don't have to download the data. They can have as much of the data as they want. And now we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do with all the data. Um, and I think I'm hurting for time, so let me just do a couple quick things. We're doing more than just this RWGS program. So we have a really exciting neuro-oncology program we're doing, and I'm very excited about this mother and women study that we're doing. San Diego County has 20 years of paired maternal fetal blood spots, and so I think the biggest newborn ad advance in like the last three or four years was a folate increase in your diet, decrease in spina bifida, so we're doing three demonstration projects to see if we can find more things like that. It turns out the US um, is second only to the Philippines for the highest preterm delivery rate. So we're looking forward to exploring that a little bit more. We have a fairly impressive scientific advisory board that we just kicked off um, earlier this summer. So Dr. Back, uh, Blackburn just got the Nobel Prize. George Church doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> everybody else is really good. So. Um, <laughs> God, I know, I don't actually, I'm not allowed to speak publicly very often because <laughs> all these reasons. So, um, yes, I was uh, not the first choice to come here. There's a lot of highly qualified people at the Institute. We collaborate really closely with UCSD, and obviously all of our collaborators in industry have been uh, totally awesome to work with, so thank you very much. Yeah, it's just so spectacular. It's fascinating because, you know, there's been a real wave where there was a whole 
and I'm talking about a little bit about this tomorrow, but the sort of extravagant expectations about what, yes. what could be accomplished and then sort of a period of somewhat disappointment and people saying, oh, is it ever going to deliver? And then here you have, yeah. you know, families and, you know, profoundly impacted and you're just accelerating and figuring out how to grow it. So it's, um, it's incredibly inspiring. I, 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 I love what, what's happening <laughs> there. And it, it's such a privilege to be a part of, yeah. to be a part of this and to be helping it. Uh, any uh, one or two questions about, about uh, how they do it at Radies? Nothing technical. <laughs> any other questions about suckage or lack of it? No? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right thank so you. no for George, no for Zach. We got it. All right. Very, very good. <laughs>